practiced or received the practice of Shigen, you have to understand we received it not from an ordinary being, not an ordinary scholar, not an ordinary teacher, or ordinary monk. Not that there's anything wrong with being ordinary, but we received it from one of the greatest living debate masters, ex abbots of Ganden Monastery, erudite, seasoned tantric practitioner, an oceanic master of sutra and tantra, a person who is well known for his occult abilities, and a highly attained master, a master of all masters, a master that taught the Geshis and the monks of Ganden, Sarah Drebo. His Holiness Kyabje Songramji was not an ordinary person, was not an ordinary monk, and was not regarded as an ordinary monk, not only by me, but by the monks of Ganden, Sarah Drebo. Songramji's erudite understanding into the sutras and tantras was renowned in Ganden, Sarah Drebo. He was famous in Tibet famous in his region of Kham, famous in Ganden, and everyone in Ganden respected Saramji deeply and was their teacher. When Saramji gave teachings in Ganden, then people from Drepung, monks from Drepung, scholars, geshis, abbots from Drepung, and Sarah would flock to Ganden to receive teachings. Saramji was not an ordinary person, was not an ordinary monk, was not an ordinary scholar. He was one of the most highly respected Gelugpa teachers of the last century. The level of his erudite, erudite learning is unmatched except by a few. And this is not my own compliment of my guru. This is what everybody believes in the Gelugpa world when I came to the monasteries. I lived in the presence and served and received teachings and and received commitment from one of the greatest and most erudite masters of the last century that escaped Tibet. Saramji's name is famous in the Gelugpa world. Famous not because he's a movie star. Famous because of his learning, his practice, his abilities, his mastery of Sutra and Tantra. Unrivaled. His Holiness the Dalai Lama was extremely affectionate toward it would pull on his goatee and tug on it in a playful manner. And Saramji was an extremely loyal, humble, and devoted student of His Holiness Kyabja Trujaramji. Now, Trujaramji is exactly the same as Kyabja Saramji, the tutor of the 14 Dalai Lama, a Geshi Haram of the highest degree, a, a Gandhin Triba incarnation, a master whose line of incarnations stem back to the time of Buddha when he was the Buddha's personal chariot driver. We are receiving teachers from a line of erudite masters and practitioners that is beyond doubt, even a shadow of a doubt of their qualifications. I had the fortune to study with Kensa Rinpoche, Kensa Losan Tachin Rinpoche in New Jersey. I had the fortune to receive teachings and practice from Geshe Tsurim Gelsen of Ganden Shatsu Monastery and lived with him for nearly eight years. I had the fortune to study, to be with, to receive lineages and practice and teachings from his solas, Kabja Saramji. I made a promise to these lamas. I made a promise to Saramji that whatever he gave me, I will practice to the end of my life. I don't need any other explanation. I don't need any other talk or convincing. I made a commitment to Kabja Saramji and his two disciples, Geshe Tsurim Gelsen and Kensal Losan Tachin Rinpoche. I made a commitment to Saramji. I swore to him that whatever practices he gave me, inclusive of Gelchen Dorji Shukin, I will practice until the end of my life. It is impossible that I will break my commitment to my Ruguru. It is impossible. 
in 1986 when I arrived in Dharamsala. Uh, that was when I was going to be ordained by His Holiness. And it was the first time I'd heard any hint about a ban against Dorje Shukden. You have to understand I was 22, 23 at that time, very young, and I came from Tutan Dajali in California, and all my gurus practiced Dorje Shukden. We all practiced Dorje Shukden every single month, and all of our Dharma students did it. Um, there was no issues, no problems, and I was very innocent and young, and um, had a very good view of things, even you can say idealistic. I think most people who are young are idealistic. It's as they get older, they see reality of things, and in learning to deal with it and how they deal with it is how a person matures and form formulates their kind of thinking and actions later on in life. I had wanted to make a tanka of Kebja Saramuchi in the center and emanating from his heart a light with Vajugini and another light coming out as Dorji Shukden because I feel Saramuchi is a guru and he emanates the Yidam and the Dharma protector. So the Dalai Lama's personal assistant was my very good friend. And we have lost contact these over years, but he was my very good friend. And um, he's from Namgyal Monastery. And he took me to the Tanka painter, the personal Tanka painter of the Dalai Lama. And I told him what I wanted. And the Tanka painter was very nice. He said to me, well, I'll paint Saramji, I'll paint uh, Vajugini, but I'm not going to paint Dorji Shukdin. And I was like, oh, why not? He says, oh, because um, we don't paint that. So that was the first time I ever heard about the ban in 1986. And then I had talked to another friend of mine in Dharamsala who was a Tibetan, a fellow Tibetan, and he was also a reincarnated Lama, uh, very well spoken in English, a translator, and also uh, a scholar. And he had told me basically that there has been rumors at that time that perhaps Dorji Shugan's practice should be curtailed, and uh, some people will say that it's not beneficial and that perhaps we should stop and that in the future the Dalai Lama might even speak up about this and I was really taken aback and I was really shocked to say the least and um, it was very traumatic for me because it meant that I had to pick either the Dalai Lama or my guru because if the Dalai Lama is correct then my guru is wrong if my guru is wrong, all the practices I receive from him are wrong. If I picked my guru, that would mean I cannot have a, a, a dharmic relationship with his holiness, the Dalai Lama. And that disturbed me very much too, because I truly respect and love his holiness very much. And he's one of my teachers. So I was in a room in Dharamsala, and I, order, I offered sung, sung salt, or incense, heavy incense, juniper incense, for three days straight on my windowsill. I, in fact, I burned the windowsill, and I made prayers to Dorje Shugen, and I cried a lot, and I was in a, in a slight depression, and I was very disturbed, and I was very confused, because I was told to choose between the Dalai Lama or my Guru Sangramji, to choose between my two Gurus. How can I do that? How can I do that? Because if I choose Saramji over the Dalai Lama, I break my commitments with Dalai Lama and I go to the three lower rounds. If I break my commitments with Saramji and choose the Dalai Lama, I also break my commitments, my Guru devotional commitments, and I go to the three lower rounds. Either way, I go to the three lower rounds. Maybe some of you don't have that dilemma or that issue because you didn't receive teachings from either or Lama. A Dorji Shugen Lama or a non Dorji Shugen Lama. Maybe you don't have that issue. But all of you must sympathize that I had that issue. And not only me. Thousands of monks in Gondin Sera Drepung, hundreds of thousands of people in Tibet who have faith in the Dalai Lama and also have faith in Trichanamji, Saramji, and Dorji Shugen. And so for the first time in 400 years, we are forced to choose. And I cried for three days. I was very depressed. I didn't know what to do. It was one of the most down times of my life. I think 
the most depressing part of my life, the most saddest part of my life was when His Holiness kept his and she passed away. That was the most difficult time of my life. And I think the second most difficult time of my life, really, I mean, and I've had so much, was to have to choose between the Dalai Lama. And there are, there are people who are anti-Dalai Lama and say, you know, I should speak, again, speak up against Dalai Lama. And they call him different names and they, they degrade him. They say bad things about him. But I can't do that. That's who I am. That's my commitment. I have received teachings from him. I can't do that. Okay? Um, there are people who are on the Dalai Lama side who tell me, hey, you know, you should renounce those you then and, you know, your lamas are wrong and all that are wrong and you should follow Dalai Lama. I can't do that either because either way I lose. And people have to understand that. You are not in that predicament, but I am. You see, when you die, you will not experience my death, my bardo, my future life, my karma, my repercussions, and my breaking of samaya. You will not receive my results. I will receive my results. So you don't tell me to choose the Dalai Lama or Dr. Shukdin or Saramji because I will experience the repercussions of choosing. You will not. So therefore, what is important is this is at the end of three days, I talked to my friend, the Tibetan Rinpoche, and he basically scolded me in a very kind way. And he says, you know what? Don't be silly. You don't have to choose. Respect both. Keep up your practice and don't need to say anything. So I thought that's the only solution. That's the only solution. So, um, but it distressed me. It wasn't an easy decision. And after that, I still attended many of Dalai Lama's teachings and I loved it and I gained a lot of knowledge. And I also attended the teachings of my other Lamas. I, have, I told you 16 Lamas. 15, 16 lamas. Um, I have attended the teachings of my other lamas, and as I said, 13 of them practice Dorje Shukdin and encourage it. So, I choose not to choose between lamas. If His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, I cannot attend his teachings, then I will abide by his holy wishes and I will not attend. It's not I don't want to attend, it's not that I'm making a statement, it's not because I'm silently protesting or you know, uh, making a secret message that I'm not happy? No. If His Holiness says that I can't attend, then I won't attend. And when His Holiness says I can attend, I'll happily go and attend. And that's how I feel, because Dharma teachings is Dharma teachings. I'm not practicing Dorji Shukden to hurt anyone, to damage anyone, to make a political statement, or to align myself with some government, or some movement, or some political movement. I'm not interested in politics. I've never gone for a protest against China. I've never gone for a protest against the Dalai Lama. I have not gone for any protests for or against any of these political movements because I am a Buddhist monk. I shaved my hair and put on the robes of Lord Buddha to study, practice, meditate, and to control my negative mind so that it can be transformed into becoming an attained being. I'm an ordinary person, an ordinary being. My intentions to become a monk and to practice and to follow these great masters is strictly spiritual. My practice of Dorje Shukden has no alignment in any way, in any politics. The so-called ban if we want to call it the ban or not call it the ban, the injunction or the edict or the talk against Dorje Shukden started very strongly back in 1996. But I received this practice in 1983. That's 13 years difference. It is impossible that a great master like Kevja Saramchi can be practicing a negative being that is destructive and harmful, and hateful, and damaging, and wishes to threaten the Dalai Lama's life. How can a master of Kebja Saramji's caliber, a master of Sutra and Tantra, and an abbot of Gandhi Shati in Tibet, close to the Dalai Lama to the end of his life, someone who marked on the calendar the day he would die, 
the day he would be cremated and gave indications of his future rebirth. This pastor even had control over when he will die, where he will take rebirth, and wrote it down in his calendar. We can see that very clearly in his biography. I saw it. Is it possible that Saramchi is so incredibly dull, wrong, unintelligent, to not see for 81 years, okay, let's just say maybe 50 or 60 years of his life where he practiced Doryshikten, he cannot have any indication Doryshikten is negative? And that only in 1996 we hear Doryshikten is negative, and Saramchi is wrong, Trijaramchi is wrong, and all our lineage gurus are wrong. Is that logically possible. If Saramji is wrong and he practiced Doji Shukdin and he lost his refuge and he became degenerate because of practicing Doji Shukdin, Kabjit Saramji died practicing Doji Shukdin. He died practicing Doji Shukdin, meaning all the way to the end of his life. Even at the end of his life, before he planned to leave his body, he did pujas to Doroshuddin and told Doroshuddin, you have been a great assistance to me my whole life. Many of my works were accomplished because of your help. I have nothing else to ask of you. Here are some salt offerings. And then two weeks later, Kapsa Saramji went into death meditation and passed away, sitting straight. Is it possible that Kapsa Trijaramji, the root teacher of the Dalai Lama, is practicing a demon, a spirit, something evil, his whole life? If Kebji Trijaramchi is practicing a spirit and a demon, and he's practicing something evil his whole life, that would mean that he lost his refuge vows. If he had lost his refuge vows, he has lost the basis of his three vows. His Prakti Moshe vows, which is the monkhood, then he's disrobed, he's not even a monk. And his Bodhicitta vows, his refuge vows, same thing, and his tantric vows. So his three set of vows are gone. His Prakti Moshe vows, which is monkhood, right? Along with that, on the basis of monkhood, you have to have refuge vows. So if he's practicing Dodi Shukin, then Trijaramchi lost his refuge vows. He lost his monk vows because the way the monk vows can be taken is based on refuge vows. If the refuge vows are broken, you cannot be a monk. For example, if I'm a Buddhist monk, suddenly I'm not a Buddhist anymore, I don't want to practice Buddhism anymore, can I still be a Buddhist monk? Obviously not. If I'm not a Buddhist monk anymore, then naturally I lose my tantric vows and my bodhicitta vows. To receive any initiation of Manjushri, Tara, the Kriya Tantras, the Charya Tantras, you need to have refuge. To receive initiation of the higher Tantras such as Hevacha, Bajukini, Yamantaka, Kala Chakra, Guya Samaja, Sita Manitara, etc., etc. You need to have your Bodhisattva vows intact. You need to have your refuge vows intact. So is it possible that Trijaranchi practiced Dorji Shudin till the end of his life? Because of his practice of Dorji Shudin, he lost his refuge vows. Because he lost his refuge vows, he lost his monk vows. Because he lost his monk vows, right? All the other vows are nil already. They're not dependent on the monk vows, because you can take those vows without the monk vows. But because he lost his refuge vows, he lost his bodhicitta vows, and he lost his tantric vows, and therefore, whatever he's teaching people and initiating people and giving practice to people is also nilled out. Is that possible? So that means all the teachings that Trijaramchi gave to the tens and tens and thousands of monks in Tibet and in India, in the monasteries, have no blessings? Is that possible? So that would have to lead us to believe that all the teachings, initiations, practice, commentary, oral transmissions, passed down to the Dalai Lama, the current Dalai Lama, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, passed down to him, all those are nil and defunct and no blessings also. Is that possible? So that means the thousands and thousands of Geshis and teachers and masters that are alive in the world today and the generation above me 
who received so much teachings and the whole lineage from Chujaranchi and from Saranchi, they're all praying to a Lama who lost his refuge vows, who prayed to Doji Shugit. That means every Gelupa center, every Gelupa monastery must remove the pictures of Chujaranchi and Saranchi from the monasteries. That means Gandhin Sarah Drepom. Their prayer halls must remove the thrones, must remove the, the pictures and any teachings and any texts from these masters. That means that the Dalai Lama should not be teaching any teachings by Trijayamchi or his lineage. None. Why? Trijayamchi went to his passing, to his death, practicing Doji Shukin to the last minute. He never gave up. Kepji Saramchi practiced Doji Shukin till the end, until he passed away. He never gave up. So therefore, these two are Doji Shukden Lamas. Since they're Doji Shukden Lamas, then they have lost their vows. They have lost their practice. They should have no attainments. So anything we receive from them, that is, all the tantras, all the sutras, all the initiations, all the practices, are ineffective. In fact, you have completely cut off the Gilupa lineage at the knees. The person cannot stand up anymore. So therefore, is that possible? Now, what we are told by the leadership, what we are told by the leadership is Doji Shukin is a demon, is an evil spirit, he harms the Dalai Lama, he harms the welfare of Tibet. He harms anyone who practices him. In fact, we shouldn't even say his name because it will attract negative energy. How is that possible? So Saramji is a walking negative energy. Trijaramji is a walking negative energy. How is that possible? When I arrived in Gondin Monastery, 1988, January. I arrived in Gandhan Monastery, Gandhan Shatse Monastery, Pukong House, in 1988, January. I prostrated and I walked into the monastery. I was introduced to the abbot and I became an official member of Gandhan Shatse Monastery. Prior to that, two months, uh, one month prior, to, two months prior to that, I was ordained as a Buddhist monk in Dharamsala by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So back in 1987, I was ordained by the Dalai Lama into a Buddhist monkhood. Therefore, my ordination name is Denzin Sopa, which comes from His Holiness, whose name is Tenzin Gyatso. And so he's my ordination teacher. My refuge teacher is Kenso Losan Tachin, who practiced Doji Shugit. My tantric teacher is His Holiness Kepji Saramji, who practiced Doji Shukden. My sutra teacher is Geshe Tsurum Gelsin, who practiced Doji Shukden. So I have Kensuramji, Saramji, and uh, Geshe Tsurum Gelsin, who practiced Doji Shukden, versus Dalai Lama, His Holiness Dalai Lama, who doesn't practice Doji Shukden. So when I arrived in Gandhin Shatse Monastery in 1988, I was, what, 23 years old, 22, 23, around that age. I was extremely excited. That's where I planned to live for the rest of my life. That's where I planned to stay. And there was Zimmeramji there. There was Kepji Latiramji there. There was His Holiness Gandhin Tripa of Gandhin Jangse, Jason Jampel, uh, uh, Jampel Shampen. There was Kepji Demolochiramji down the street in Drepom. There was Kepji Jagoramji. There was Dryan Dokden Rimji. There was the great Kensu Jambayeshi Rimji. There was the great Geshe Kunchu Tsering. There was Masters all around us. You walk out of Gandhin, left and right, there's this erudite Geshe, there's this erudite master, there's this great Rimchi, there's this great Tukul, all around us. And then within a few years, His Holiness Kepji Chiyaramji's incarnation came to Gandhin. So guess what? My house, Tem Lajang, is bordering with Trijan Lajang. So I used to see Chiyaramji as a young boy playing, and he'd wave at me, I'd wave at him. Of course, we'd fold our hands. So Chiyaramji lived next to me. Bef Right next to that was Zimmeramji's house. Right down the street is Saramji's house. 
than the oracle's house. There's all these erudite masters, Latin and G's just around the corner. We're all there. We're all living there. And guess what? Every single month when we do the protective puja in Gandhin Shati, Gonchil Na, Bendin Lamo, Mahakala, Kalarupa, Veshavana, and White Mahakala, Gonkar, we include in Setrap's puja and Dorji Shukin's puja. So every single month, all of Gandhin Shati did Dorji Shukin's puja. And guess what? Gandhin Shati has a protector hall. It's called a Gonkang. And within that protector hall, you have Setrap, you have Shipta Genye, which is a special protector associated with Lama Tsongkhapa, you have Kalarupa, and you have Doji Shugen. And every day, there would be a Shugden black tea offering in Gandhin Shati Monastery. And in Gandhin Shati Monastery, we had Doji Shugen's statue there. We had Doji Shugen's image there. Later, Kajasaranchi built a special uh, had instructed to build a special Doji Shugen chapel called the uh, Gyachen Ten Kang right next to Saramji's house. So next to Saramji's house, you had the Gyachen Ten Kang, which was a special place, a temple dedicated to Doji Shugen in Gondin Monastery with an altar Doji Shugen and a throne. The throne housed the throne uh, housed an oracle there who would take trances of Doji Shugen once or twice a month publicly and privately. So next door was a oracle of Dorji Shugen trained by Trijayaramchi and Saramchi living there. And he would take trance of the peaceful Dorji Shugen, the wrathful Dorji Shugen, he would take trance of Setrap, he would take trance of Kachimapo, and a few other Dharma protectors. Right there. And Saramchi, Trijayaramchi, Zemeramchi, Lati Rimchi, Kensu Jamba Yeshi Rimchi, all of them would consult the Dharma protector. In fact, in fact, once a year, doing Tibetan Losa, once a year, we would have a special trans session in Gandhin Shatsi Monastery. They set up a throne, and all the abbot, the abbots, all the high lamas, all the tukuls, all the geshis, and the whole assembly of monks would gather in Gandhi Shatsi Monastery. And guess what? The oracle of Doji Shudin would be invited into Gandhi Shatsi Monastery, sit on the throne, and the wrathful Doji Shudin would take trance, and the abbot, the ex abbots, the lamas, the tukuls, the geshis, even myself was there, we go up and offer a kata to Doji Shudin. And then those shooting would throw rice to the audience and bless all the monks and then leave. Next song will come with the etc. Same thing, same procedure. Third was the peaceful Doji Shudin would enter in Gandhi Shatsi Monastery. And when the peaceful Doji Shudin came, he was called Dunzin. He would wear the hat of Lama Tsongkhapa, the robes of a monk, and he would sit on the throne. And all of us would go up and greet him, make offerings, including the abbot, including the teachers, the masters, everyone. And Then we sit down, and Dori Shudin would give a Dharma talk. And then the monastery would ask him questions, and he would give prophecies about the future. This was every single year. Now, as I shared with all of you earlier, when I arrived in the great monastic institution of Ganden Shatse Monastery, you have to understand, Ganden Monastery was founded over 600 years ago by the great yogi, master, teacher, Mahasiddha, and fully enlightened saint, Lama Tsongkhapa. And from his students, they also built Drepung, and they built Sarah. So in Tibet, before 1959, you would have around 10,000 monks in Drepung Monastery. You would have close to 6,600 to 6,800 monks in Sarah Monastery. And in Gandhi, you had 3,000 to 3,300. And these are not including the mon monasteries such as Amdo Tashikyo, which is thousands of monks in Amdo, is not including the great monastic institution of Panchen Lama, which is Tashin Lombo in Shigatse, 
is not including all the hundreds and hundreds of other great monastic institutions that are spread out all over Tibet and um, Kalmykia and also in Mongolia. And so Gandin Monastery is a starter of these monasteries because that's where Lama Tsongkhapa, the founder of the Ginlupa School of Buddhism, resided, where his students built the monastery for him, where he lived, where he taught, and where he kept the Buddha's teachings purely in, Lama, in uh, Gandin until his passing. So um, Gandin Monastery, since Lama Tsongkhapa's time up till now, has been unbroken, totally unbroken. And in 1959, due to the Cultural Revolution happening all over China, where the Chinese suffered, Tibetans suffered, everybody suffered. Um, many Tibetans, many Lamas, the, the masters of Gandhin Sera Drebung left to India and reestablished Gandhin Drebung Sera in South India. So I went to South India, as I mentioned earlier, and joined Gandhin Monastery in 1988. The reason I joined is because Kevjus Saranji instructed me to join. He instructed me upon my request. You see, because I wanted to pursue another career and then I wanted to become a monk, the reason I wanted to pursue the other career was to earn money to help support the Dharma growth of the Dharma centers of my teacher. So I asked Kevjus Saramji for a divination. Divination is foretelling the future through dice. Very erudite masters who have done very powerful and deep meditations. They can do divination into your future and give you the right answer. So Kevjus Saramji was a renowned and famous divination master. So I asked Kevjus Saramji whether I should pursue this career I had in mind or become a monk or how. And Saramji told me that if I was to pursue the career, I would be successful and I would make it and it would be good and it would be beneficial. But if I was to become a monk, it would be more beneficial. He left it up to me. So I said earlier that he instructed me, but in other words, it was his gentle way of saying that I should become a monk. He never forced me. So when Kevin Saramji gave this instruction, I folded my hands and I put my head down to Kevin Saramji and I said to him, I will become a monk, as I intended, since your divination said so. And so I was in the United States for a few years, paying off my bills, earning my money, getting some money together to go to India. And when I arrived in India, 1988, uh, January, I joined as a promise to Kevin Saramji. Uh, now, when I arrived in Gandhin, as I said earlier, I would say in Gandhin Shatse, 95% of the monks practiced Dorji Shukden. The other 5% that did not practice, there was no issues. In Gandhin Jiangsei Monastery, the other side of Gandhin, of Gandhin Monastery, most, many monks practiced, many great, the high lamas practiced, the teachers practiced. And in Drepung, many, many monks, many masters practiced. In fact, there was one Kamsen in Drepung called Nari Kamsen with about 200 plus monks and their Kamsen protector was Dorji Shukden. What's a Kamsen? In the monastery, in Gandhi Shati, you divide it, you're divided by 11 Kamsens. A Kamsen is a sorority house. So if you come from a province of Tibet, you speak a dialect, you have a customs, you have a kind of language. When you come to the monastery, you will stay in a Kamsen or a sorority house. Why? Because the different dialects in Tibetan, they can't understand each other when they come to the monastery. In the monastery, you have monks from all over Tibet that speak different dialects, and dialects don't match. So if you come from A province, you go to A Kamsen. If you come from B province, you go to B Kamsen, simply for the language. So what happened was, um, in Nari Kamsen, in Drepung Monastery, their main Dharma protector of the Kamsen is Dorji Shukden. Each Kamsen has a Dharma protector. Each monastery has a Dharma protector. So Gandhin Shati's Dharma protector is Setra. Gandhin Pukhang, my Kamsen, is Four-Faced Mahakala. But at the same time, we all practiced Dorji Shukden, and we also had a chapel for Dorji Shukden. Um, as I said, there was, no, there was no issues in any way, shape, or form with Dorji Shukden's practice. Um, in Sarah Monastery, you have Bumara Kamsen. 
Bumbra Kansen has four to five hundred monks. And their whole Kansen, their Dharma protector again was Dorji Shugden. And this has been going on for hundreds of years. So in Sarah Monastery, you have practice of Dorji Shugden, very strong. Pabongka Rimchi comes from Sarah. So everybody in Sarah, the seniors, were students of Pabongka Rimchi. So everybody practiced Dorji Shugden. In Drepong, you have Kamsans who are individually devoted to Dorji Shugden's uh, practice as their protector. In Ganden Shatse, it's pervasively Dorji Shugden plus with chapels. So in Ganden Sarah Drepong, majority of the monks practiced Dorji Shugden. And the ones who didn't practice, there was no issues. For example, if you go to Ganden, you have a percentage of monks focusing solely on Tara practice. You have some of the monks solely focusing on Hiruka practice, solely focusing on Yamataka practice. One monk may do Yamataka practice as their main practice, and they can do the, the other practices as a commitment practice. For example, they do a little Tara, they do a little Manjushri, they do Tsongkhapa, they do Guya Samaja, they do Vajagini, but their main one is Yamataka. So similarly, you have monks in the monastery who focus mainly on Tara practice, who focus mainly on Yamataka practice, but when they focus on Yamataka, it doesn't mean Tara is not good. When they focus on Tara, it doesn't mean Yamataka is not good. So therefore, in the monastery, you have an individual choice of what practice you wish to do, what meditation you wish to do, and there was no issues whatsoever. Um, and it was often, you would hear a master, there was one great master there called Geshe Tendar, when I was there, and he would give Dorji Shugen initiations in Kandan Monastery. Sokte. In Drepung Monastery, you had Kyabji Chagun Rumji, who gave Dorji Shugen initiations up the street. Kyabji Chagun Rumji was also a very erudite, gentle, pure monk, scholar, master, Haram Bageshi. Very great master in Drepung Monastery. I myself had the great merit to receive many teachings from Kyabji Chagun Rumji also, who has passed away already. But Everywhere, Ganden, Sarah, Drepung, you had these practices going on of Dorji Shugden, and you had temples dedicated to him, and we do the pujas every single month. There was no issues. There was not one single word that Dorji Shugden would harm His Holiness the Dalai Lama's life, that would harm the Tibetan cause, that would harm other people or bring damage. Nobody in Los Angeles, in Tutin Darjeeling, nobody in Ganden, Nobody in Ganden Shatse, certainly nobody in the monastery I belong to, Ganden Shatse, ever prayed to Dorji Shugden to hurt the Nyingma sect, to hurt the Dalai Lama. How could we? How can anyone even think that? To hurt another lineage, another practice. And that if you practice Dorji Shugden, you need to put down the Nyingma teachings, disrespect the Nyingma teachings, or put down other sects. No such thing. Not one single monk in Ganden Shatse Monastery that I belong to talked negatively about the Nyingma sect, the Kaju sect, the Sakya sect, or said that Dorji Shugden is against them, or that Dorji Shugden cannot, uh, doesn't like them or will harm them. Impossible. You have to understand, Ganden Shatse Monastery is 600 years old, founded and started by Lama Tsongkhapa, and it is a factory of erudite geshis. Over the last 600 years, do you know how many incredible Geshis, teachers, masters, Gandhin Tripas, Shapa Chujis, Jiangzi Chujis, Kensors, Tukuls, meditation masters, Mahasita that Gandhin Shatsi has produced? His Holiness Trijaramji is from Gandhin Shatsi Monastery, the root guru of the Dalai Lama. So, no one in Gandhin Shatsi Monastery, none of my teachers, None of the monks ever said, hey, let's do Dorji Shukin practice to hurt the Dalai Lama, to hurt Tibetan people, to hurt Tibetan nation. No one ever said that we should practice Dorji Shukin to hurt the Nyingma teachers, the Sakya, Gilukpa, uh, Kasa, Kaju teachers. No one. Do you think someone of Trijaramchi's caliber Saramchi's caliber, Kensu Jamba Yishi, Kebji Lati Rumchi, Kebji Zemerumchi. Do you think these great master of masters would be teaching in the monastery? Oh, practice Dorji Shukin so we can shorten the Dalai Lama's life. So we can destroy the cause of Tibet. So that we can get money from China. What is all this talk about money from China? 
As an 18-year-old young boy in Los Angeles, California, that did not speak a word of Tibetan, that's never been to India, never been to Tibet, never been to China, never been to the Far East, never traveled anywhere in the Far East in my adult life in Los Angeles, meet Saranji, get initiation of Dorje Shudin, and I'm being paid by the Chinese government to practice? Do you think in our little Dharma Center in Kupton, Dajiling, Los Angeles, we are taught to do Dorje Shudin Pujas to shorten the Dalai Lama's life, to hurt the Tibetan nation, to hurt the Tibetan people? Why would we do that? Why would anyone do that? How is that even possible? Dorje Shugden is taught to us by Captain Chujian Ramchi in his volume that he composed about Dorje Shugden and by my gurus as an emanation of Manjushri. Being an emanation of Manjushri, Dorje Shugden harms no one because Manjushri has no karma or instinct or ego to harm. Dorje Shugden does not harm anyone. And you know what? You don't need to be Gelukpa to pray to Dorje Shugen to get help. You don't need to be Nyingma to pray to Guru Rinpoche to get blessings. You don't need to be Gelukpa to pray to Tsongkhapa to get blessings. You see, Guru Rinpoche and Tsongkhapa are not Nyingma or Gelu. They're just Buddhas. We label them Nyingmas. Why is Guru Rinpoche Nyingma? I don't think Guru Rinpoche in his life ran around saying, Hey, I'm Nyingma. Only Nyingmas can pray to me. I don't think Tsongkhapa in his life ran around saying, Hey, I'm Gelukpa. Only Gelukpas can pray to me. So, Guru Rinpoche will bless anyone whether you're Nyingma or not. Tsongkhapa will bless anyone whether you're Gelukpa or not. And Dorje Shikdan will bless anyone whether you're Gelukpa or not. Dorji Shugdin is not bound by color, race, culture, barriers, socio-economic economic background, or your religion. Even if you're a non-Buddhist, even if you're uh, uh, um, uh, you know, atheist, whatever, if you ask Dorji Shugdin for help and you're sincere, he will help. So Dorji Shugdin do not, does not harm. There is no text for Dorji Shugdin to harm. They say, well, there's some wrathful liturgy in Dorji Shugdin's prayers and Kang Sol, his pujas, and his exhortations and all that. It's quite wrathful. You know what? Read Pelin Hamel's prayers and Kang Sol. Read Kala Rupas. Okay? Read Mahakalas. They're just as violent. They're just as rough. They're just as visual. They're just as full of gore, blood, uh, skulls, corpses, etc. Because those are all symbolic. They're a tantric symbology. Hello, think carefully. Vajugini is naked wearing 50 human skulls, wearing five skulls, drinking out of a skull cup. How visual is that? How violent is that? Stepping on a man and a woman. Yamataka's got a buffalo head, carrying weapons and intestines and skulls and heads and blood and, and uh, innards. Think, Kalarupa is standing on a bull molesting a male with a consort who is a ogress with a buffalo's head, with his body naked and his secret organ exposed, okay? And with his bare fangs out, riding in blood, in an ocean of blood. What do you think about that? Bandan Hamlo has her breasts hanging down, wearing skulls, wearing fresh human heads, with her fangs sticking out, four fangs in fact, two on top, two at the bottom, okay? Carrying a bag of diseases, riding in a mule over an ocean of blood. You know that red thing that's under Ben and Lomo's mule? That's an ocean of blood. Blood. Not strawberry milk. Blood. And Ben and Lomo is got claws and weapons and chains. Isn't that kind of visual and rough? Every, I would say, 80% of the Tibetan Dharma protectors are rough, naked, on fire, with fangs, with blood, with gore, with intestines, with skulls, wearing he human heads. Not just Dorji Shuk Den. And their liturgies, when you read it, are very violent and very wrathful and very... You go and read Pendant Hamel's liturgy. Google Pendant Hamel's prayer. Google it. Google Kalarupa's prayers, Damzin Chögel. 
Google Mahakala prayers. Google these Dharma protective prayers and read the liturgy and see how wrathful they are. So don't tell me, oh, Doji Shukin's uh, liturgy is very wrathful. See, kill, destroy, blood, gore. It's tantric symbology. I'm not going to get into the symbology now. We don't have time, but it's tantric symbology. All right? So Doji Shukden does not harm anyone, does not hurt anyone, and if he can harm and hurt anyone, who is he harm and hurt? Which Thingma Lama did he kill? Which Gilukpa Lama? Which, which, which Dalai Lama did he kill? Please think. Please think carefully. And all of you, some of you people who are saying negative things that Dodi Shudin, he didn't harm you. Oh, because you're protected by the three jewels. Well, so is everybody else, so what are you worrying about? Everybody who took refuge in the three jewels cannot be harmed by any, any um, uh, demon or spirit of Dodi Shudin, so what are you worried about? You don't even need to talk about it. So Dodi Shudin does not harm anyone, and he helps everyone, and he assists everyone. And guess what? You owe him nothing except the transformation of your mind to be a better person. That's what any Dharma protector require of you. To say the Nyingma Lamas can be hurt by Doji Shukden. To say the Dalai Lama can be damaged or sh his life shortened by Doji Shukden. In the monastic debate courtyard, you will be defeated within a few minutes with logical debate. How can a great Nyingma master any great Nyingma master be harmed by a spirit, a ghost, an evil being. If they can be harmed by an evil being, a ghost, or spirit, then they're not great masters, are they? We go to great masters to seek refuge. We go to great masters to receive teachings. We go to great masters to protect us from harmful beings. So if these great masters can be harmed by evil, negative beings, then they're not great masters. They're not attained. Then that means those Shukin can hurt the Buddha himself, can hurt Tsongkhapa. We believe the Dalai Lama is an emanation of Avalokiteshvara. I believe that. I still believe that. I've always believed that. And I will die believing that. Are you telling me that Doji Shukden, if we want to assume him to be a negative, negative spirit, can harm Avalokiteshvara, the Dalai Lama, can shorten his life, can destroy his work, can be a damage to what he wishes to do. Think about the ramifications of that type of statement to run ignorantly around saying that. If the Dalai Lama, if His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, can be harmed by Doji Shukden, then we might as well not practice Buddhism anymore. If His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, can have his life shortened by a so-called evil spirit, any evil spirit, then can he be Avalokiteshvara? So on one hand you say, we say, I say, everybody says, he's Avalokiteshvara. On the other hand, you're saying that he can be harmed by evil spirit. Which one is it? Can he be harmed by evil spirit or is he Avalokiteshvara? Do you think Avalokiteshvara, Manjushri, Vajapani, Tara all take refuge in something else and protect themselves from Dorji Shukden? How illogical is that? How illogical of people to say His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, can be harmed by an evil spirit, any evil spirit, or Dorji Shukden, evil spirit. How is that possible? Then, the Dalai Lama has a very high status. He is the spiritual and secular leader of the Tibetans for hundreds of years since the Great Fifth. So the current Dalai Lama, the current um, great manifestation of compassion, Dalai Lama, is believed and is respected by Tibetans to be the secular leader the emanation of Avalokiteshvara, a great erudite master, a great pension, a pandita, which he is. And he could be harmed by evil spirit? 
So when people on the internet say things like that, do you know that you're indirectly degrading the Dalai Lama? You're indirectly degrading enlightenment or the attainments of a high being? Now, in the, in the teachings by Buddha, even in the Vinaya Sutras for monks, if you become a monk and you hold your vows well, your vows, even as a simple, ordinary monk like myself, cannot be harmed by any evil spirit. And if someone is being afflicted by an evil spirit, a monk may take his Zen, this is called a Zen, the upper robe of a monk, and if his vows are intact, he may take this robe and place it onto the person, and that spirit will not be able to remain and must run. Because the power of the vow of the Sangha, the power of the vow of the monk, is very pure. So when he covers that person, that person will be protected. That goes for a monk or a nun. So a very pure nun who has her vows intact is a very pure and perfect object of refuge and offering. So when she takes off her Zen and she wraps it around a person who's been afflicted by a spirit, that spirit has to flee, has to run, has to leave. So even an ordinary monk or nun cannot be affected by an evil spirit, never mind someone like His Holiness the Dalai Lama or one of the high lamas of Nyingma, for example, His Holiness Kyabje Peno Rinpoche, His Holiness Kyabje Dingo Kense Rinpoche, etc., etc., etc. Do you think His Holiness the Dalai Lama, His Holiness Kyabje Dingo Kense Rinpoche, His Holiness Kyabje Peno Rinpoche can be harmed by Doji Shukden or any evil spirit? Do you want to keep proliferating this type of ignorance and downgrading their attainments and putting down who they are. On one mouth, you're saying, oh, Dalai Lama is Avalokta Shura. On the other mouth, you're saying, oh, he's going to be harmed by Doshira. You've got to stop practicing. You'll break his samai and hurt the Dalai Lama. I don't believe any evil spirit can hurt the Dalai Lama. I don't believe any spirit can shorten the life of the Dalai Lama. I believe he is Avalokiteshwara. I believe that since I was a child. I believe that now and I will believe that until the end of my life. I don't care what other people say. That is my belief. That is my choice. That is my direction. It benefits me and it benefits more people to believe he is Avalokiteshwara and he is. The end. Could everybody be wrong? Trajaramji says he's Avalukta Shura. Saramji says he's Avalukta Shura. Zimaramji, Latinamji, Kansaramji, Gishitudam Gelsen. All of them told me he's Avalukta Shura. Are they all lying? I don't think so. He's Avalukta Shura. The oracles of Tibet say he's Avalukta Shura. The prophecies say he's Avalukta Shura. Guru Ramji 1000 years ago said an emanation Avalukta Shura will come to Tibet to lead the people. Is everybody wrong? Well, I'm just an ordinary monk listening to these great masters. Now, the Dalai Lama has a very high position. He is the secular ruler of Tibet, the king of Tibet, or the spiritual head of Tibet, as you would like to label it. His status is very high because that's the prayers he has made in his previous life to come back to benefit others in that kind of position. But on a strictly spiritual level, once you become a ninth stage bodhisattva, 10th stage bodhisattva, 8th stage, 7th stage, 6th stage, whether you are a China man from China, a Mongolian man from Mongolia, a Nepalese man from Nepal, you are an American man from America, you are English man, you are a Japanese man, you are a Taiwanese man, if you reach ninth stage bodhisattva, all these people come together, they are exactly the same, although physically they're different, their attainments and signs. That means the attainments of one Buddha is equal to another. I mean, I, it's obvious, right? Is Manjushri higher than Tara? I don't think so. Is Tara higher than Manjushri? I don't think so. Once you reach the level of Buddhahood, you're the same. So whether you take refuge in Buddha, Tara, Tsongkhaba, Guru Rumchi, Manjushri, Avalokiteshvara, Vajapani, if you put one of them there, they encompass all the Buddhas because they're enlightened beings. So therefore, the Dalai Lama is 
an enlightened being. If he is an enlightened being, he must have practiced for many, many years to become enlightened, now manifesting as a pure monk. He is a pure monk. But the Dalai Lama is not the only Buddha in Tibet. He's not the only attained being in Tibet. He's not the only master that has reached that level of attainments. I am sure people, like some of the Sakya throne holders, are in very attained beings. I'm sure the great Kamapas are very highly attained beings. I am sure His Holiness Kyabji Dingo Kenze Rimchi is a highly attained being. I am sure Kyabji Chujai Rimchi is a highly attained being, Saramji, etc., etc. So when you get all these highly attained beings together, although physically, outwardly, they may look different, inwardly, their mind is equal. So one attained being can be the king of the country, one attained being can be an abbot of a monastery, another attained being can be a great nun in a, in a cave meditating, another attained being can be a cow herder, like Marpa was, he was just a farmer. Another attained being can be in a cave like Milarepa with long hair and white robes and, and not even taking the monk vows, not even a Geshe. Milarepa never studied to be a Geshe. He never, doesn't have a Geshe degree, but he became enlightened. So whether you are an ord ordinarily, uh, you are a being manifesting in an ordinary form as a cow herder, as an abbot, as a nun, as a monk, as a chit practitioner, as a yogini, as a yogi, as an abbot, as a Gandhin Tripa, as a Sakya Trinzin, as the Dalai Lama, as the Panchen Lama. You have to understand, the outside is different, but the inside is exactly the same. So therefore, Trijaramji's mind, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's mind, Kaji Pabankaramji's mind, Saramji's mind, all these great lamas, their mind, the inside is a Buddha is a fully attained Buddha. But in the outside, one person manifests as a leader, one person manifests as a, as a teacher, one person manifests as a, you know, abbot or Gandhin Chiba, whatnot, and so on. That's just the outer manifestation. A Buddha who is a farmer, a Buddha who is the king of a country, when you put them together, they're equal objects of refuge. They should be shown the equal respect. They should be shown the equal amount of body, speech, and mind, respect, equal. It doesn't matter if one is a cow herder and one is the king of a country. If they're a Buddha, they're a Buddha. For example, whether it's Tara or Manjushri, you must show equal respect, equal. Whether she's female and she's a lady, oh, maybe that's inferior, that's completely wrong. Number one, women are not inferior. They're equal or even better in some cases. So. Whether it's Tara or Manjushri doesn't make a difference. A Buddha is a Buddha. Whether a Buddha became a Buddha aeon ago or today, those two Buddhas are the same. Oh, you became a Buddha today, so you stand in the back line. I'll show you respect later. I don't think so. So this is how I think. This is how I see my faith. So therefore, I believe the Dalai Lama is a Buddha. I believe Saramji is a Buddha. I believe Geshe Tsurim Gelsen is a Buddha. I believe Kyabji Trijan Doji Chang is a Buddha. I believe Kyabji Pabongko Doji Chang is a Buddha. I believe the Panchen Lama is a Buddha. I believe they're Buddhas. So, since they're Buddhas, how can Buddha Trijan Ramji be practicing a demon his whole life and not know? How can Buddha Dalai Lama be harmed by a demon? How can a Buddha be harmed? Doesn't make sense at all. So for me, in a logical kind of thinking, it doesn't make sense at all. For me, I have received teachings and I have received ordination from His Holiness the Dalai Lama. But the most teachings I received was from Kebja Saramji. The Lama that made the biggest impact on my life. What do I mean by impact? That turned my life around, that changed me to become a monk, that put me on the path to develop bodhicitta. I didn't achieve it yet. I'm on, I'm work in progress. Was Kebja Saramji. So Kebja Saramji is my root Lama. Kebja Saramji told me 
to practice Dorji Shukit. That was his instruction to me. Whether Dorji Shukdin is a demon or a spirit or a ghost or a Buddha or Manjushri, that's for you to think, study, and decide. But to Kavji Saramji, Dorji Shukdin was Manjushri. To Kavji Trijaramji, Dorji Shukdin was Manjushri. My teacher and his teacher says, Dorji Shudin is Manjushri. So if my teacher tells me he's Manjushri, he is Manjushri. Let me give you a little example. We can have a rock, and that rock is just a rock. But if your guru tells you that rock is an emanation of Manjushri, and you take that rock and you put it on the center of your altar, you clean it, make offerings, prostrations, believing it to be Manjushri, then through that rock, not from the rock, through the rock, Manjushri's blessings will come to you by the blessings of your teacher, by the blessings of your belief. Anyways, Manjushri statues are made of brass. Before you create them to be Manjushri, they're just a piece of brass. Who's going to go wash a brass? Manjushri statues are made of um, um, clay, carved from stone. So before you carve or create Manjushri statues from clay or stone or brass or gold or silver or whatever, it's just gold, silver, clay, and rocks. So who's going to go and worship the rock? Who's going to worship the statue? Who's going to worship the stone, the brass? Who's going to worship all that? I, I'm not going to go and prostrate to a pile of rocks or to some clay. But if you mold it into Manjushri and um, a, a monk, a nun, a teacher, or someone who's qualified, blesses the object and invites Manjushri to enter and sit and become one with the object, then you are not praying to the statue. You are not praying to the rock, to the brass, to the metal, to the stone. You are praying to Manjushri as symbolized by that object. So when you offer precious items and gold and put it on the throne or put it on the altar or shrine or make prostrations or offer incense to that image, you are not worshipping that image. You are worshipping what that image represents. Well, you say, why don't you just worship Manjushri directly without any images? Because not all of us can visualize Manjushri very well. Not all of us has the power of visualization. It's easier to say, this is Manjushri, place this on your altar and do your meditation on Manjushri, than to say, oh, visualize Manjushri. Well, what does he look like? We'll be talking the rest of our life to everybody, what does Manjushri look like? Easier just to have a statue. So therefore, Manjushri is symbolized by this statue made of rocks, clay, wood, whatever you carve it from. So therefore, if my teacher told me that this stone is Manjushri, and it's emanated as Manjushri, and it's blessed by Manjushri, blessed by Manjushri, fine. I believe my teacher. By the power of believing my teacher, when I make offerings to this stone, I'm not making offerings to the stone, I'm making offerings to Manjushri or what it symbolizes. Then the blessings of Manjushri will come through this. Why? Because Manjushri's power is stronger than the stone. Similarly, if someone, if, if someone gives me Doji Shukden and says, if my guru gives me Doji Shukden, which he did, and says, this is Manjushri. If Hypothetically, Doji Shukdin is an evil spirit. Then by the power of me believing him to be Manjushri, the evil spirit is overridden. The form is Doji Shukdin, but his essence becomes Manjushri. So you are still praying to Manjushri. Let me repeat. Manjushri is much more powerful than any evil spirit. Because Manjushri is a fully enlightened Buddha, one of the eight main great disciples of Buddha Shakyamuni. So therefore, Manjushri cannot be overpowered by Mara, delusions, karma, klesha, dukkha, suffering, or any evil spirit. Manjushri has no karma to suffer, has no karma to receive harm. Therefore, no evil spirit can harm, damage Manjushri. That is why we can go to take refuge in Manjushri, who is free from samsara's fears, 
free from samsara's clutches. He's a Buddha. Therefore, a Buddha can enter a statue, a Buddha can enter a tanka, a painting, or just a clear space in front of you. If you invite the Buddha to come, whether you can see him or not, Buddha Manjushri will come in front and you can make prayers. If you have special sight or special insight from meditation, you can perhaps see Manjushri. I can't, but I'm sure there are masters who can. So therefore, since Manjushri is a Buddha, and some people say Dorji Shukden is an evil spirit, if I believe Dorji Shukde to be Manjushri, so be it that the form is still Dorji Shukden, but the mind, Manjushri, has entered and expelled the demon, and therefore he's Manjushri. Manjushri can emanate as a woman, as a man, as a, 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 a boat, a captain. He can emanate as a bridge. He can emanate as you know a piece of potato. He can emanate as a cup, as a table. He can emanate as a great teacher, Gandhian Tripa. He can emanate as the king of China, he can emanate as um, a great lama, a great teacher. He can emanate as a Buddha, a Bodhisattva, a Yidam, Yamantaka. He can emanate as Dharma protector, Kalurupa, Dojishuddin, Mahakala. He can emanate in any form he wants. There is no limitations to what Manjushri can emanate. So don't put limitations on an enlightened mind. So therefore, if, Dojishu, if, if, if Manjushri can emanate in any form, why not as Dojishuddin? So therefore, even if hypothetically Dorji Shukdin is an evil spirit, hypothetically, once you invoke Manjushri to come and enter, and then you visualize Manjushri as Dorji Shukdin, then it's not Dorji Shukdin the evil spirit anymore, it's Manjushri, whatever the outer form is. Similarly, you can invite Manjushri to enter a rock. It becomes Manjushri. It's your belief. So therefore, why visualize Manjushri as Dorji Shukden when you can visualize Manjushri as Manjushri? Good question. I'm not visualizing Manjushri as Dorji Shukden. Dorji Shukden is an emanation of Manjushri, recognized by the great lamas for the last 400 years. Now, in Tibet, in the last century, within the Gelugpa school of Buddhism, the most influential teacher the teacher of teachers is Kyabje Palbongka Rinpoche, Kyabje Jujia Rinpoche, and Kyabje Song Rinpoche, with a whole slew of other teachers. That means all of our lineage, all of our practice, all of our tantras, oral transmissions came from these teachers that went to us directly or went to our teacher who passed it to us. So whether Jujia Rinpoche, Song Rinpoche, and Palbongka Rinpoche is a direct guru, it is definitely an indirect guru. So when you start saying that Chujaramchi, Pavogamchi, and Saramchi are practicing a demon, you are saying they're not enlightened. You are saying they have no abilities to see the difference between a Buddha and a spirit. You are saying they're unqualified. You are saying that they broke their refuge vows. You are saying that they have lost their Vinaya, Pratimosha vows. They have lost their Tantric vows and Bodhisattva vows. You are, in fact, saying that Chujaramchi, Saramchi and Pabongarumchi, our lineage masters, our teachers, are failures. And that when they die, they went to the three lower realms for practicing a spirit. Now, if Trijaramchi practiced Dojishudin until he passed away, which he did, he broke his refuge vows, he practiced a spirit, he should be going to the three lower realms. Well, his incarnation is back, confirmed by the Dalai Lama and Dojishudin. The current Trijaramchi was found by the Dalai Lama Dorishudan. They consulted the Dorishudan Oracle in Gandhian, they consulted Dalai Lama. Both the divination came out exactly the same to be the same void. Pabonka Rimchi's incarnation is back. Confirmed by the Dalai Lama and Dorishudan Oracle. Kepjasar Rimchi's incarnation is back. Confirmed by the Oracle and the Dalai Lama again. So, when you practice Dorishudan, you don't go to the three lower realms. These Lamas are back. And these are just examples. There are hundreds of other lamas and geshis and teachers who have practiced Dorji Shudan and they have returned back perfectly with a human form. No problems, no issues. So if, if Trijayan Chi was a Dorji Shudan practitioner is evil and he's negative and he broke his vows, why even look for his incarnation? Why bring him back to the monastery? Why? He, by you recognizing Trijayan Chi, Saram Chi, and Pabongka Rimchi's incarnations, 
by recognizing them, you are saying that they didn't go to the three lower realms, that their practice of door shooting wasn't wrong. That's what you're saying. So does that make sense? It doesn't make sense at all. Mm -hmm.